impression of Viv is that he's um, uh, tremendously serious about what he's doing, which is really the, what, what makes the difference between him and uh, a lesser cricketer. Uh, and his ambitions and his goals are very... I mean, he takes them very seriously and he sets his mind to get whatever he, he sets out for, you know, to, to achieve that. Uh, and his strength of will and determination backs it up. Um, that's what sets him apart, you know, and I don't think... It's a shame that he's retiring because I don't think... Uh, there's a, I, I think he could go on like this for, for quite a few more years, you know. Given, on, given the fact that it's his character that he plays with, it's not really... I mean, he has a f tremendous physique, but it isn't really just skill and technique that he's got. It's this tremendous force of character, which is what l makes him a great captain. It's an early summer Sunday in England. The sound of leather hitting willow, time to ponder, time for tea, time to browse through the Sunday paper. But above all, time to watch cricket. For today, the Duchess of Norfolk's eleven is playing host to a touring side whose roots lie not in the green fields of Sussex, but thousands of miles away in the shimmering heat of the Caribbean. For one man, the long walk to the wicket will give him time to reflect on 20 tumultuous years at the very pinnacle of his sport. cricket who only cricket know? Cricket in the Caribbean has been cultivated in a hothouse of fierce, single-minded West Indian pride, and nowhere more so than Antigua and Barbuda in the northeastern Caribbean. It's a tropical island paradise, and there's a stretch of white sultry sand wherever you look. Here in Antigua, they say there's got to be a, a, a beach for every day of the year, you know, so if that's correct, you know, I, I'm quite pleased with that. <laughs> Yeah. We here in the Leewards uh, tend to get a little bit more of a drier climate than you will get in the Windwards. They, they provide us a little bit more with our citrus fruits and things like that, the, the Windward Islands, places like Grenada, St. Vincent and, and uh, St. Lucia, Dominica. But we here, we, we are a little bit more renowned for maybe the sort of more tropical look. It, it's, it is wonderful, you know, to, to, to see this out here, you know, because Maybe this is why I think maybe it's called the tropics, you know, in some ways, because uh, having these particular environments, it does help, because, as you know, city, city life can be pretty congested, and when you do get that particular chance for you to come in an environment where there's lots of room, and especially when you be competing and pressure and tension sometimes gets to you, I think this is a, it's a wonderful place to retreat and to, to get your mind and maybe body back in order. For Viv Richards, captain of the West Indies, these are precious, relaxing moments in an exhausting schedule. His team has just triumphed over the Australians in what had been a rather acrimonious series. It is now late April, and he is due to fly out to England to start what he has said will be his last tour there. He was not to see Antigua again, until September. St John's, with a population of 36,000, is the capital of Antigua, and at midday the streets are alive with the bustle of the markets. Fruit and vegetables are displayed by the street vendors for locals and tourists. The great divide between these tourists and others lounging in luxury beachside hotels and local society is easily bridged. All you have to do is talk cricket, for it was amongst these streets that Isaac Vivian Alexander Richards was born. Viv Richards, as you know, um, is the man who started 
here in Antigua. He hails from uh, Drake Street, but it is now called Vivian Richard Street in his honor. Viv has been a very nice lad. I remember teaching him at the Antigua Grammar School. I myself taught there for three years prior to becoming a doctor. And he was a very quiet, unassuming young man who was always very attentive to what was being taught. Um, but I think that his love was always in the field of sports. He was always ready and eager to go outdoors to play his game, to play that game of cricket. And I think from very early on, everyone who saw him recognized that one day he would have risen to the stardom that he has attained. My parents were involved with the Anglican Church and provided me with that firm sort of a base which I think every youngster needs. My father is a very proud man. He's also acting superintendent at the time of the local prison in St. John's. Also, Mervyn and I sang in the Anglican church choir. But as soon as service was over, there wasn't sufficient time for maybe Mervyn and myself to go off and uh, have a crack at cricket. He comes from a very humble, uh, very humble background, a very um, good parentage. And I think that he was a rising star from very early on in his age. And then I think the boys in the area assisted him. Both, I think both the encouragement from his parents and the encouragement from the people in his environment helped to mold him and helped him to develop into the star that he became. Oh, great goal, great. <laughs> well, uh, every Sunday morning, we have a group of guys who used to play football. Um, at the premier level, who are now not playing, but just come out on Sunday mornings to, to play. So we have a team called Black Power. A little friendly, they play around the island. Um, and this, this is what we do, trying to keep fit. Um, Fib was, he generally plays with the team when he's here. So we, we, we have a good time. He was a um, captain of the national team. He used to play back, a um, very good soccer player. Um, and he's done since then, um, done some coaching and both locally as well as done some studying in terms of coaching. That's Mervyn, that's Viv's brother. Uh, he's also an uh, excellent football player. Um, yeah, this is Viv's brother, Mervyn. Mervyn Hello, how is, how you Nice to meet you too. He's down, he lives in New York and, and he's down here to play, play with us. I played a little. Yeah. At one time they said he was a better batsman than Viv. Yeah, that was very stylish. Very I, good. I, I work hard on my game, you know. But I think Viv is more natural, you know. Because I know at, at times we'll be playing and, uh, and um, I, I go to the other end, you know. This bowler who's giving me a little problem, I go to the other end and Viv does, looks a little easier. So I ask the umpire if the guy is bowling me a little tougher than Viv. You know? He says, no, because I'm, 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 I'm the one that's jokey, you know. <laughs> Most certainly I've got a great passion for, for, for this island because uh, here's where I spent most of my, my life as a, starting as a youth and growing up, going to school and things like that. Most certainly you, you would have that particular passion. Most of my friends, you know, who, some, you know, who are still here and most, you know, who, you know, who, have, uh, who have moved over to, to, to America and things like that. So uh, there's lots of things my mother and father, you know, still, uh, still lives here. So with that, you know, you, you, you've got lots of passion and uh, it's, uh, it's not bad climate anyway, so it's, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I go to Antigua on my way to other islands because I've always loved the Caribbean. And then one time I just, um, I stopped there and had a look around. And at that time in my life, I'd become friendly with, um, with Ian Botham. And it was through Ian that I met Viv in, in the first place. And then I realized that Viv was from Antigua. And that helped me on the island a great deal to, to be able to say, well, I'm a friend of Viv's, you know, because he's the king of that place, the uncrowned king. But it's a great island, and the great cricket is there. I mean, the kids, see kids of nine, ten years old playing great cricket. In the season, it's played 
you know, just the same as in England, you know, it's played everywhere, everywhere where there's a, bit, a flat bit of ground, there's someone playing on the beaches as well. My first expedition of such and uh, maybe the findings going to England, there was uh, a team by the, men of, by the name of the men, the Bacons, who came out and they played a series of games, you know, throughout the, the islands and they stopped off here and we, we had a match against them, the local team, which is Antigua. And by having that game, we, uh, the guy saw saw me how I looked. I didn't get much runs in that particular match. I, I think I remember getting something like 23 or 24, but uh, I had a good day in the field. So the guy decided that he was going to pay my passage and take me back to, to Somerset at the time without uh, the Somerset committee knowing. So first of all, it was a hiccup, you know, but uh, it was some great intentions. And for some reason, everything worked out from there. Viv became captain of the Antigua Grammar School side at 16 and went on to make his debut for the Leeward Islands in 1972. After six weeks in London with his friend Andy Roberts at Alf Gover's Cricket School, he returned home and was spotted by Len Creed, vice chairman of Somerset, who booked his passage back to play for a small club in Bath. He even got him a job as an assistant groundsman. I know what it was like to bowl against him. <laughs> it wasn't a very satisfying experience from a bowler's point of view. Um, when he first came over, he was very shy, quiet, um, said very little, polite to the opposition as well. As... He was a really nice bloke. During his time at Bath, Viv had struck up a friendship with another young cricketer by the name of Ian Botham. And as Somerset players, they shared a flat with Dennis Breakwell. We didn't really know Viv, and, and, and when Viv came over, we thought Viv Richards, you know. Is that, and we, we soon found that um, he was then and was certainly going to be the greatest player in the world with some of the shots we saw him play. I mean, it was tremendous. Well, he um, shared a flat just on the side of the ground over the road, and uh, generally we hadn't used to see a lot of each other, but um, it was good times. Ian and Viv, I think, um, I think between the two of them, they brought the game back to life. I mean, for the young people of England, uh, definitely that gave them interest to play again. I mean, they were visible heroes. They were both great cricketers. They're both exceedingly human people, you know, and accessible. I think that's important. You know, they're very accessible and open. They, they were great days. Um, neither of us, both of us just starting, uh, both youngsters. Neither of us knew what was around the next corner. And I suppose we lived life a little bit like that in those days. You know, we were two guys who met uh, one April at Taunton, and uh, over the next 10, 12, 15 years, uh, 20 years, we've developed into, it is 20 years now, isn't it? But we've actually developed into a very close relationship. I enjoyed my cricket playing with Viv in those days, and I think he enjoyed his cricket playing with me in those days. I mean, it was, it was exciting, because Somerset had never won anything, and we were, with, if you like, the nucleus of the side that came through in that uh, period. There was Vic Marks, Roebuck, uh, Peter Roebuck, um, Colin Dredge, you know, Keith Jennings, was Trevor Gard, there was a great little side, Derek Taylor. You know, they all came through in that period, and Phil Slocum, you know, who's since now selling antiques, I think, in America or something. But, I mean, there was a good setup. It was a, it was a family atmosphere down there. It was, it was very nice. Marley Richards was born in England, and although a left-handed batsman, unlike his father, he is already displaying a great natural talent. Viv also has a daughter named Matara, at the family home in Antigua, Miriam Richards is used to the life of a cricketer's wife. Miriam recalled those early days in county cricket in England. When he was a Somerset player, we were there practically all summer. He had a house there. Actually, my son was born there in Taunton at the Musgrove Park Hospital. So it didn't matter. Matter was just at play school. It didn't matter you know, spending six months here and then coming back for the winter. But um, as she got to, like, primary level, we had to sort of make up our mind, you see. So what we do now is, in July, when they're on holidays, we go over, get back in time for September. 
she can't, she's nearly 10 now, so she can't miss too much you know, of her academic work. And um, on tours at convenient periods, you know, we join him, watch a game or two, because it would be quite difficult for, you know, to travel with children you know, on a, a tour where they have matches sort of back to back and that sort of thing, in places where you don't even have relatives or friends where you can sort of you know, be stationary and then go to their respective matches. But there are times when you get lonely. There are times when you feel fed up. Following Viv's debut for Somerset in 1974, he was chosen in the same year to join the West Indies side under Captain Clive Lloyd. The Richards run machine was now in full flight. Legendary innings and numerous trophies bear testament to that. In 1986, though, his happy stay at Taunton came to an abrupt end. I, I will never forget the morning. He rang me up on the Saturday morning and he, he said, uh, Beefy, you won't believe this. And I said, what? And he said, I've just gone down the ground. I thought he was just going, they called him in. I thought it was just, you know, sort out the contract for next year, end of story. Him and Joel, and they turned around and said, we're sacking you, both of you. And that's come from, I mean, look at the people who sacked him. Who are they? What are they? Here's a man who's put Somerset on the map, who scored 50 centuries for them, won them a final. Joel Garner won them finals. Viv won them finals, and we got them to finals. And they're treated like that. And I hope that Somerset never win anything again for another 100 years. Because that's that would be a fair reward. And that's why you resigned, I think. I was not having anything to do with it. I didn't want to be part of it. I don't want to be part of the club. And the amazing thing is, I'm, the one thing I will say is I'm a little bit surprised that the members just sat back and let it happen. I thought they felt more for Viv than that. They, they dismantled uh, what was one of the best sides in the country um, on a whim and a prayer, I think. And they've been made to pay for it, and they deserve everything they get. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Somerset. I have sympathy for the Somerset supporters. Uh, but the committee there, they brought it upon themselves. They allowed themselves to be dictated to, and they, at the end of the day, they've got what they deserve. Nothing. This is Sports Action Line. Joe, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Raymond. Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, this week we'll also hear the voices of three cricket pundits, their views of the selection of the West Indies team to tour England and the inclusion of our Media interest is high throughout the Caribbean. At Antigua's TV station, Sean Nicholas, ABS TV's presenter, took time off from her nightly newscast to explain why. Antigua, or let me say in the Eastern Caribbean, is something that we always look forward to. You're the typical man in the street, you'll see him with his portable radio carrying around listening and asking what's the latest score. But as you might know that um, Australia was playing West Indies here, and that was exciting. <laughs> that was exciting. Nobody, you know, we were all giving our own uh, conclusions as to what we thought the match would be. pleasing to me to, to have accomplished victory against the Australians. Also one felt pretty pretty pleased for, for my team as well because of uh, maybe the flak you know which we, we, we received before that series actually began. And uh, I thought that uh, we came out well and uh, I think I'm very pleased for, for all who actually took part. Uh, I think they are hard people to, 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 to compete against. But uh, all in all, I, I did enjoy it. I think they, they, they taught us something, and uh, uh, the same thing which I think they, they taught us, they, they're complaining about now. <laughs> I first played with Viv, oh, the West Indies team in 1974, 75. We went to India together, and then we had the, the World Cup. And then we went to Australia in, in 76, and, and that would have been my last tour. But uh, as a batsman in the early days, he was a, a very fidgety type of fella, you know, he would keep walking round and round. And uh, I was kept in, a, in a, a game out in Tasmania in the 75, 76 tour. Gordon Greenwich, who was one of the opening batsmen, he, he, he was not doing particularly well on that tour. And, uh, you know, I decided to send Vivian first. So he went in, he got 100, a big hundred in Tasmania, 
then he opened in the last test match in, in, against Australia. He got 100 there as well. And uh, he never really looked back. Viv has been one of the most powerful hitters of a cricket ball that we've seen in recent years. I mean, he has the, the ability. It's not just a question of strength, it's timing. It is natural ability. But he has that ability to hit the ball a long, long way without apparently trying too hard. And I mean, I've seen him, I've been the victim as captain more than once of some ferocious hitting. But it is, I mean, it is talent, there's, there's no doubt about it. It's not just what you might call village being slogging by a long, long way. I mean, this man can play cricket properly. A stone throw from Vivian Richard Street is the Vivian Richard Stand. It lies in the recreation ground, a cricket stadium that was first used as a test match ground in 1981. Well, the final match that series brought yet another century for Viv, here in front of his own people. Well, if that wasn't enough, it was the end of a week which saw Viv get married to Miriam. I think uh, maybe wedding was a blessing because for some reason I ended up uh, getting 100 and everyone was pleased, you know, so it was a sort of a belated uh, wedding present. Viv was appointed captain of the West Indies in 1985 on the retirement of Clive Lloyd. And here, again against England in 1986, another milestone was reached. When you're a captain of a test match side and you're hoping, shall we say, to hang on and save a game, what you don't want to see is the opposing captain coming out with murder in his eyes, about to score the quickest test hundred in history. And at St John's there in Antigua, at the recreation ground there, he literally hit the ball to every part of the ground. It didn't matter who bowled, but it was Ian Botham who was looking for another couple of wickets for a record, whether it's John Embry who would back himself in one day cricket to stymie normally the best of players. It didn't matter who bowled, the ball's going to go a long, long way. Some of it even one-handed, some of it two-handed, some of it orthodox, some of it very unorthodox. At one stage, I, I did literally have everyone on the boundary, realised that that was wrong as well because, of course, he's an experienced cricketer. And so he settled, well, I mean, I'd take a couple of twos. So again, but we did really have 80% of our fielders on the boundary and the ball kept clearing them. When you've got someone like that in that sort of form, I mean, it really is impossible to stop him scoring. An innings that only probably just to play. And uh, it's certainly, if he wasn't king of Antigua before that, he certainly was at the end of it. I decided I didn't get much runs in the first innings and I felt, you know, it, uh, it wouldn't be nice coming home without obviously, you know, getting to the act. But, and uh, I went out and a few hit the middle, a few came off the edges and things like that. The sort of luck, you know, that one, one do need, you know, when you are uh, going to for, for some sort of excellence. And it worked out and for some reason someone told me during that particular match and at the end of the match as well too, that it was the, the fastest uh, 100 in, in test match cricket. Yeah. I was pleased about that because uh, even though you, you may have gone abroad you know, for quite a long time and you've played your game abroad mostly, everyone wants to, to show your, your, your hometown people exactly what it's all about and the things you know, that you have achieved, you know, not just hearing it over the radio or seeing you on the telly, but to seeing you in the flesh. You know, it was something just wonderful and very special. During this 1991 series against Australia, Viv had become only the seventh batsman to score 8,000 runs in Test cricket. He had also overtaken the great Sir Gary Sobers as leading West Indian run scorer. This was thought to be his final Test match at the Recreation Ground, and not surprisingly, the spectators displayed mixed emotions. I, as a friend, would be sorry when Viv retired, but I know that one day he has to retire. Um, I don't believe that um, I'll see um, more type of shot that Viv played any longer, but one of those things, every cricket-loving um, people would be sad for at the day that they've retired because um, he has brought so much joy to the people of Antigua and the entire world in general that it would be a sad day. See, the reason that uh, he is retiring is one of the reasons I've come over here because I thought the chances of seeing Viv Richards and Gordon Greenwich play again, well, being an Australian, I would get the opportunity. Uh, so uh, it's sort of a once-in-a-lifetime, uh, really, to get this last chance to see him back. It's a shame he got out for a duck, though. Maybe in the second dig he'll get a century. But... We highly respect Bill for his cricket ability, and we feel that, um, um, you know, in his dying days, it would be nice that he retires while he's on top. It's sad to see the man go when they drop him from the team, you know, because he isn't performing. But I think uh, during his years, he's been a credit to cricket. I feel he has achieved a lot, most anything any batsman wants to achieve in cricket. 
Well, if there is a time, it wouldn't be no sadness because there is a time come that a man should be retired from doing anything. As a boxer or a footballer, as a cricketer, the time has approached that he should be retired and let some other young man take over. But I believe that the name of him will live forever. First time I saw Viv play, he was leading the Leewards against Guyana. I'd noticed that they had set up this massive kind of PA in the stands uh, with stacks of speakers, huge, like as if there was a rock concert going to go on. But, but nothing was happening. And Viv was in, and he got to about 96. And then something happened. There were some rude boys out on the boundary that were taunting him about his method of play. And he threw his bat down, which I've never seen him do before. He was really in a really upset about the whole thing and he told he shouted out something about if you think you can do better come here you know and then he went on and got the century and the minute he got his hundred these speakers came to life and they actually had a reggae or calypso song coming out of them about viv getting a hundred I, mean, I don't know whether they made that up for the day or whether it was a song that had been around for a while but it was fantastic i mean you'd never get that in england it was tremendous <laughs> Although the West Indies had won the series, and Viv had never lost a series as captain, the Australians had won the Antiguan match. As the teams departed from the ground, the captain could be found entertaining some of the opposing team's fans in the dressing room. Have, uh, this sort of entertainment it keeps people, even the people who are watching, Entertain us. What about when there's the wickets? I know, I know that. I love it, I love it, I love it. 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 I love you know, this, 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 this is what I think, uh, they're, they're much tougher grounds, in a sense, and, you know, you go and you get certain lush grounds in England. Yeah. England, I think, is the best grounds that you can get, you know, in the sense of uh, the turf. Yeah, they're the best. You know, but uh, competing at whatever level, you know, whatever society, yeah. Yeah. it's important, you know. Like going to India, some people say they don't want to go to India and Pakistan. Why? Why? Why not go? You know, you go, you go there, you go there, and you try and stop them, and they want to. You know, it's a, it is a, you are respected then. You know, you you kind of just say, well, I'm gonna wait until things uh, get uh, good, then I'm gonna play again. You, know? you gotta go where things are rough, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's very important, very important that uh, you go and you play other people in their backyards. I've never opted out of a tour, in a sense, apart from my injury. Injuries. I'll go anywhere and so play. When's the next week? I don't think uh, I would like to go on forever, you know, and uh, have cricket dominate my life totally, you know. It's, uh, one would like to, to, to venture out and go into various ways and, and see what one, you know, how one can make it, you know. So now we have the perfect day. Yes. Perfect day in paradise, man. Yeah. There's no better way than this, you know? yeah. I believe in this to the fullest. Uh. The first time that I went out on one one, I couldn't believe how, uh, how relaxed and peaceful it could be, you know? Yeah. Because most of the times, like here in Ireland, where you have a, you have a car and everyone recognizes your car. That's right. Hey, baby, man, what's up, man? What's up, you here, man? They don't see because none of these guys are that brave to come over here. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing going to say yeah. hello is some barracuda. Barracuda, yeah. Hey, babe, <laughs> don't I know you from somewhere? <laughs> <laughs>
Every year, sailing week, of course, is the last week in April, first week in May. And this year happens to clash also, of course, with the, the test match. This is not very good timing from certain point of views, but it makes us certainly very busy for, for one week. Yachts come here for two days. We come here tomorrow uh, in the afternoon and leave Friday morning. And so it's uh, party time on the beach. The whole beach is, turns out to be a one big party. I know him in a different way than most people know him. I know him as a business uh, colleague, and he's a very uh, sincere, uh, honest person. Uh, and he um, isn't as, it's hard to put it, when you see him in the, the, the field of play, he's very aggressive, and, but when you get to know him, he's a very uh, sensitive, laid back person, very nice person to, to know. Thank you. Thanks, mate. All right, great, great, man. I gotta be running now, you know, because yeah. uh, I got another appointment, right? So, we'll see you guys tomorrow, huh? No worries. You have a good day, brother. You too. Take care, man. Take good up much. to last night, all yeah, right, yeah, huh? Good right. match, right? Nice to see you guys, huh? We'll see you at the cricket. Cool, man. Well. See you guys. Bye bye, huh? Keep your wife at the side. All right, cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, where's the no? Our hero, man. Yeah, cool. Yes, yeah, yeah, right, man. Nice, Fine, man. man. Love, you know? Keep up with the good work. Guidance, guidance. Nice, Yeah, it's always uh, hard, you know, when you're going to leave, especially these sort of conditions, and you go to a place like England. England, everywhere, I think, in the world has got some sort of a quality, you know, and it depends maybe when it gets a little bit too hot. Maybe this is why I need to cool down a little bit in England. So uh, it, 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 it all has a, its little part to play, regardless of whatever country, you know, that you, you, you may come from. Because whenever we leave here next Wednesday, we know it's all going to be business and it's going to be lots of hard work. We know that uh, maybe England would be preparing, getting themselves you know, physically and mentally ready in order to, to cope with that tour. And we'd have to work a little bit harder as well too, you know, but it's a tour that I've always enjoyed, a tour that uh, Whenever you go to England, you look forward to, to playing at certain grounds, you know, because of certain tradition, you know, which, uh, which I held. And it's just a nice place to play cricket, you know, and uh, everything is organized in a sense when it comes to the cricket. So it, uh, it should be a nice tour, pretty enjoyable sort of tour. arrogant no I, I think um, I've come across this a lot before uh, with people who are very good at what they do but aren't necessarily comfortable with the spotlight and, and uh, their shyness is often mistaken for arrogance it, it's it's completely mis misunderstanding that's all I know I know Viv uh, personally to be a gentle shy private man the press can hurt you badly, and uh, it, there's nothing you can do about it. You never become immune, uh, and, and the more you are in the public eye, especially if you're out there at that particular moment trying to win, you are very vulnerable uh, because your emotions are raw, you're trying to do some, something which may have never been done before, uh, and you're taking dreadful risks in terms of uh, emotional vulnerability, and the press seem to sense that. 
And I don't know what it is. There's a vulture quality about journalists, you know. And even the best of them have that thing where they want to go for the jugular and score a point. You know, it gives them some kind of satisfaction. But for Viv, being out there, I mean, to, for me to to conceive of what he does is almost impossible. To stand, I mean, it's hard. You, when you walk out to the crease as a batsman, the feeling when you make when you walk from the pavilion to the wicket is frightening. Let alone if they're attacking your personal life or making, you know, rash comments about your, your ability to do a job as a captain in the press. I mean, the, the pressure is enormous. Yeah. There's quite a lot of people who we need to put, you know, to shut up, you know, who may, maybe put some plasters and things like that on their mouths, you know, because they, they think they know so much, you know, and uh, yet they know nothing. I've worked hard at my game, and just to prove some of these people who thought that Vivid just was just a, a flamboyant uh, old brat, you know, who, 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 who just went out and, uh, and did things his way. If it was, uh, if he had us to play maybe in a different sort of role, he couldn't cope with it. Yeah, I think these particular knocks are for, are for these particular people because uh, how stupid they can get, you know, with some of the statements and things like that that they do come up with. I don't know what else they're going to write now. Uh, we've got to wait and see. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure, really. You know, it's uh, something that's pretty exciting for us because most of us who have played in this country do know what to expect and things like that. And uh, we, we've got you know, the greatest respect you know, for the cricket you know, that's obviously been played here. And uh, the setup and things like that, everything seems to be so well organized. So, well, certainly, it's always nice to, to, be, to be in those parts. The West Indies have been on the road since last winter, and key players were feeling the strain of so much cricket. They had lost the three one-day internationals against England, but the captain had not lost his quiet optimism. Well, I was never a guy, you know, to count all chickens before they hatch, you know, but uh, one should always feel reasonably confident that the fact that uh, certain things can be achieved, regardless of uh, the way we, we played in the three one-days, uh, One's got to give it to England for, for playing the way they did. I, I personally felt that they, they were totally professional at their game. And uh, I do hope that maybe we can show them a thing or two when we, we get into the test match. The weather in England in the early part of the season was some of the coldest known. Even some of the cricketing press were sympathetic to the sight of Kirtley Ambrose wearing three sweaters. Yeah, it's a little bit dodgy at the moment. Uh, we, we haven't had the best of uh, summers as yet. Nine, you know, we are guys you know, who do operate in the tropics. But uh, I'm, I'm confident that for some reason things can get better and uh, everybody can have a good time. Listen to this song. Not far from the Headingley Cricket Ground is Viv's Batmaker, and he took the opportunity to visit Eric Loxton, who fashions his blades from carefully chosen English willow. Carl Hoops Hooper and Viv's protege from Antigua, Hamish Anthony, were amongst the interested spectators. For Carl, it was to be an important outing, as along with Richard Richardson, another young pretender to Viv's throne, much was expected of him in the forthcoming series. They've been making bats for me now for the past maybe four or so years, and uh, it's, uh, it's always nice to go up and see, see people like Eric and Neil and guys at the factory, because it's not all the time that it's always the wisest thing for you to have them send bats to you for you and for you to pick up one and feel, well, that's the one who's going to do it. If you're in the factory, you can dictate terms in a sense, you know, that uh, you can speak to the man who is involved and uh, you get everything the way that you'd like him to. And uh, it's always nice. Uh, we do make a trip there every now and again. And uh, especially of the, the importance of this particular trip, it's nice to know that uh, one can go up and make sure that one have the right sort of size, uh, the, the, the sort of fit in the things that you ask about, and everybody will be happy. Despite scoring 73 runs in the first innings, Viv could not match England captain Graham Gooch's match-winning total of 154 not out. England won by 115 runs. It was the first time for 22 years they had beaten the West Indies. And so, on to Lords. Well, I'm feeling pretty happy at the moment because uh, I think I've had a, a wonderful time on the circuit. Uh, 
certainly there are regrets, you know, but uh, not regrets that one would uh, like to share with anyone. But all in all, uh, I had a good time, and uh, I'm just hoping that uh, one can, uh, we can do it one more time, and that will be it. Uh, one can go and do whatever one wants and, and feel totally happy and satisfied within yourself that you have given your best and uh, you, you've had your, your rewards at the end. Throughout my career, I've had a wonderful time. Uh, I said at times, you know, that uh, it would only be when I start losing my love and that particular appetite for the game, you know, and it's creeping in, it's starting to creep in. Uh, I can feel it, you know, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I said to England that uh, I know definitely that will be my last tour to England. There's no way that I know I'm going to tour England again as a West Indies player. Before the Lord's Test, ex-England captain Bob Willis and the National Sporting Club hosted a luncheon for the West Indies. Lance Gibbs watched over his team with a paternal eye. The managerial job is, is behind the scene, you know, where you make sure that the fellas are uh, well behaved, well, you know, certain things are, are done in the best possible way. The fellas are nice lads, you know. Uh, every now and again, because of human nature, you get a difference as far as things are concerned, but on the whole, they're quite manageable, put it that way. The captain is, is the man that's in, in, in view all the time, you know, and uh, you wouldn't hear of a tour as Lance Gibbs' tour, you'd hear of Richard's tour, you know. When, when blame is being showered, even though both parties is going to take it, the, the blame more or less goes as to the captain. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask everybody, apart from the West Indies party, if they would now make their way down to the fourth floor as luncheon is served? If I could just ask the West Indies party to stay behind for one quick photograph, then we can all go and enjoy our lunch. Every cricketer's dream is to play at Lords, the headquarters and mecca of English cricket, the home of the MCC, the Marylebone Cricket Club. In 1805, the year of the Battle of Trafalgar, Lord Byron was the captain of Harrow Public School when they played Eton for the first time. Thomas Lord, a Yorkshireman no less, had given his name to the place. And for almost two centuries, the five acres of lush green velvet has been the venue to battles of a different kind. The famous Long Room at Lord's, as it is called, is a shrine to cricket containing artefacts from years gone by. Although cricket is played worldwide by both men and women, the MCC still shuts its doors firmly on women members, even to this day. The museum here contains the famous ashes, whilst the hall still seems to echo to the sound of the boots of cricketing legends clattering up the staircases. One of the most famous of them all was Dr W.G. Grace, who in his lifetime took 5,000 wickets and scored more than 80,000 runs. I've been tossed up a few times, you know, I've got a few scars uh, around, my, uh, around my eyes and things like that. And, and sometimes, you know, if you do see a fastball, notably like a Dennis Lilly, you know, who's got a cricket ball in his hand and uh, it's coming down at you something like 90 to 95 miles an hour. It's a frightening sight and especially a big row, sort of Aussie row behind that and uh, the sort of machoism that, uh, that goes uh, with that as well too. It gives you that feeling that you've got to compete because uh, it's like you're going to be in sort of a, the lion's den and being in that lion's den, you, you're going to be devoured. So one's got to, to, to react as, as, as quickly as possible. There are times, you know, when we, we are away that uh, most certainly one would try and focus as much as possible to, to exactly what's happening at home. We do share a boutique in, in Antigua, in a sort of a fashionable uh, complex, which is called the uh, Heritage Key. 
and uh, we try our best and, and see it, you know, sell maybe some local things and things like that. And I think being an Antiguan as well, I, I do have uh, a lot of uh, consideration for, for people who I think needs a much better way of life. You cannot uh, expect you're going to go and grab the bull by the horn, but at least try and work towards that and to try and create that sort of uh, a unity which I think have left us. I think that he has spoken in glowing terms of Antigua and Barbuda at all times, and we are very proud of a son of the soil who has attained such heights and continues to do well, not only for Antigua and Barbuda, but for the West Indies as a whole and for the black race. He led the way for us. Um, as a black person coming from a third world on the developed country, and he showed us that if you were committed to what you wanted to do, if you were persevered, if you had some goals that you could achieve. And um, really, I, I look up to him, really. For me, Viv is my hero. And judging by the queue at this book signing, he is many other people's hero as well. Cricket is not one of the highest paid sports in the world. A test cricketer's earnings pale into insignificance against money earned by tennis players, American footballers, baseball players and basketball stars. So endorsing books and products is one way to pay the bills of an enforced international lifestyle. A superb historic uh, cricketer, notably a batsman. And uh, I mean, it's reflected in a number of books I bought. I mean, these are for people we've uh, had along today who are keen cricket fans and have uh, seen the epitome, I suppose, of cricket in Viv Richards today. I think this is for Viv Richards' benefit, I think, isn't it? <laughs> been a great cricketer, so it's nice to give him some support back. At every stage in everyone's life, someone has to retire, but um, now when it goes, yeah, it'll be a sad day. The Lord's Test was drawn, leaving England still one match ahead in the series. Carl Hooper scored a fine century, but Robin Smith countered with a superb 148 for England when the home team looked down and out. Heavy rain ended this particular battle after just 25 minutes on the final day. Beauty. Down at the county ground of Hampshire in Southampton, the circus rolled on. The tour itinerary still stretched out before the West Indies team. Viv Richards took a break from this match, but was still in attendance in his role as captain, as the Hampshire team included Robin Smith, fresh from his big score at Lord's. In the meantime, Carl Hooper was in great form with the bat. The Hampshire club had been home to Viv's childhood friend, Antigon Andy Roberts, and more recently, the legendary Barbados bowler, Malcolm Marshall. Viv's namesake, Barry Richards, one of the greatest batsmen ever, also played here and had flown in from Australia to watch the contest. I think I've got some very vivid uh, memories of Viv playing for Somerset. We had Andy Roberts in our team and obviously he was a very fearsome fast yeah. bowler so uh, his contest with Viv was something to behold because uh, neither would give an inch and of course they were nice to relish it at slip because uh, you know, it was a contest between a great batsman and a great bowler. And uh, also in World Series cricket, I don't think anybody during the two years that I was involved with it played better than Viv in 78 and 79. I mean, he just looked awesome and uh, invincible and, and played as, as well as I've ever seen anybody play during the 20 years that I watched cricket. He's done extremely well over the years. Uh, he's been vice-captain for a long time on the Clive Lloyd. And when the mantle was thrown onto him, he, he carried on in quite a, a wonderful way. Uh, as you've said, we had, you haven't lost the series as yet, but, uh, you know, the, these are things that can happen. And uh, it, losing a series could, could easily make him a better man. But, uh, you know, winning has become a habit with us, and uh, we hope that we would win this. Apart from being wet, it's... Uh... <laughs> It's all right, it's all right. Uh, it's, uh, there are times sometimes when you enjoy the rain and things like that. And, and as I said before, being a, 
being a sort of a natural sort of person, a person who enjoys the environment. What's wrong with the rain, you know, for a game of cricket? As you know, we are still one behind. We, we, we had some bad luck with the weather at Lord's, you know, but I'm quite certain that uh, things would get better. And one cannot afford one spirit supposed to die at this moment. Uh, I was always a guy that's pretty hopeful, a guy who feel that, uh, who believe, you know, that uh, in not saying die, you know, and uh, we're going to chase, we're going to chase them all the way and they'll have to play some good cricket in order to maintain that particular lead. And chase they did. The West Indies fought back to win the third test. Viv playing a true captain's innings of 80 to help his team square the series with two matches to play. Viv is now a Glamorgan player and one of the next matches was at Glamorgan's ground in Swansea. After playing for Richton in Lancashire, he joined his present club in 1990. By coincidence, he had made a Man of the Match award debut here for Somerset in 1974. Life had now turned full circle. He certainly helped uh, Glamorgan become a much more formidable side. And there's no doubting that whatsoever. And, but Viv's done well at Glamorgan. He's made them into a good side. And yeah, they could be little dark horses for a competition next year when he gets back. They, they are people with a particular passion, and because of that particular passion, the way we, we, we felt as Antiguan, not because you were, you were from a small part of the world or a pretty small island, that people think they could take liberties with you. And uh, I think the Welsh, they possess this particular pride, notably small, small land. And uh, the people you know, who came out of that particular land, notably some of the rugby greats and numerous other, other fields. So, uh, it, it, it was uh, important to, to, to have, you know, to have formed that particular relationship with the people here and uh, I'm quite certain that uh, they enjoyed it and uh, certainly I did. I only hope that I can come back next year and uh, everything continue to be the same. In the fourth test match, after a shaky start to the second innings, Carl Hooper and his captain came together to produce some glorious strokes, win the match and retain the Wisdom Cup. Viv Richards would keep his record intact. In many ways, it's sad to see him retire, but I'm, I, I'm, in many ways, I'm happy that he's in the position where he can retire. Uh, he deserves his retirement. He's, played, he's been a tremendous sportsman. Um, I mean, you can bestow all the accolades in the world upon him as a player, but from my own heart, you know, there's never been, there'll never be another Viv Richards. He's the best player that I've ever seen, and the best player I've ever had the privilege of playing with or against. I, I just uh, hope, you know, that day when I went out that it was going to be my day, and I kept uh, trying to, to pinch myself that it was going to be my day. And I was a little bit worried at first, you know, when I saw just the little ones, you know, who were coming out to take me, you know, but uh, in the end, I saw the, the beefed up ones who did come, and uh, I felt a little bit more secure then, because at first you had someone like Gus Logie, and you know, had uh, someone like David Williams, and Jeffrey Dujan, you know. So I'm saying, hey, where's the real beef, you know? But in the end, it worked out well, you know, and it was just a pleasure to, to know that uh, guys do think that of you, and because I do feel the same for them. And it was just the wonderful harmony which we had shown on tour and we had shown on the previous tours they've had. Yeah, it was nice to, to share a little fear because I think it was worth it. Uh, maybe because of what, has ha what happened with the, the players being, you know, taking me off the field and things like that. Seeing that particular thing, it was, uh, it was a tear or two because I knew what it was like just before lunch when we were 20 yards for, for three. Yeah, and then to see the difference, the, 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 the transformation in the team at the end, you know, it, it deserved a tear or two, you know, and uh, I'm not shy or bashful to, to actually say that now. sad in some ways, uh, but it's nice to be involved in it, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. That's suppose the I ideal scenario would be he gets 100 and we win the match. I hope he does well. It's his test. I 
I'm just I'm just pleased overall to to be uh, to be playing my last game here in England in a Test match. And what I think to to have someone like uh, Ian who who is going to be in the team as well. It's um, the appropriate sort of an, an of occasion. I think this was sort of a godsend because he's one of my great heroes, one of my great friends, and just great companion. And uh, it's just wonderful that he's back as well too. So. Uh, it's uh, a lot of things to feel actually happy about rather than to be sad. <laughs> very loath to believe retirement stories. I mean, even when they're, you know, properly presented and from as a serious as a guy as Viv is, I can't believe it until it happens. But if it, sh if it should be true and he is retiring and I, I think it's a sad loss to the game, but at the same time I wish him all the best of luck with whatever else he chooses to do.